57 points or so. Apple shares are just getting hammered. Down 43%. So almost everything there completely wiped out. And the NASDAQ, everything and more has been completely wiped. We're in the last days of this country surviving. How in the world can we find the billions of dollars that we have borrowed from China and Japan? Like this could be the most serious recession in decades. Wall Street is fraud. America is fraud. The world is fraud. Banks are fraud. Central banks are fraud. We live in an era of fraud. Terrorists. Terrorists, jihadis of banking, they're here to kill you and themselves. After September of 2008, nobody believed in the banking system. And this is where Bitcoin comes from. During October of 2008, an internet cryptographer published a short white paper describing how cryptocurrencies would work. He was hidden behind the name Satoshi Nakamoto. You need to think of this creation like you would think of communism. By that, I just mean that the theory went much before the practice. Although the idea started in 2008, the first Bitcoin transaction happened in May of 2010. My goal today is to go through the theory behind Satoshi Nakamoto's ideas. And let's just jump into it. Before going in details about how cryptocurrencies work, let's talk about how cryptography works. You've heard of the first encryption system, Caesar's cipher. Caesar's cipher works by shifting every letter by a fixed number of positions on the alphabet. This number is your secret key. That's not a safe technique since you can guess the secret key quite easily and because you can know if you're right, if you understand the language. Although, it looks random. Your first solution is to make the encryption algorithm different for every different message. But this will also make it impossible for the receiver to know if they successfully decrypted your message. This is where public key comes in rescue. Everyone will have access to this key. You will have your rubbish message, your decrypted message, and the public key and using a certain function you will be able to verify if you successfully decrypted the message now you might say you can use that to decrypt the message by calling this function repeatedly but that's never going to happen since we usually use 256 bits long at least messages which means that your chance of guessing correctly is 1 over 2 to the power of 256. 2 to the power of 256 is larger than the number of atoms in the galaxy. Public and secret keys will become useful for later. Right now, let's say you're exchanging money with your friends, but you're too lazy to always carry money with you. So, you and your friends set up a list of transactions. A gives money to B, C gives to B, B gives to A, etc. Using this list, you can always climb up all the transactions to determine how much money you currently have. Right now, B has $6. That list is made so that everyone has access to it. But how can you stop your friends from adding lines and give themselves your money without your consent? This problem is solved by banks, for example, by asking you to sign the paper checks that you send. In the case of cryptocurrencies, you will also have to sign. In your computer, you will have a secret key that you can use to apply your dig digital signature using the transaction and the secret key. That signature is different for every transaction. This means that no one can copy your signature for another transaction. That's like if you had a different signature for every check you signed. No one can copy it. But that would also mean that no one can be sure that the signature is correct. This is why everyone has your public key, so they can use it to verify the digital signature that came from you. Since your signature is at least 256 bits long, no one will just guess your signature. Also, no one can copy-paste the same transaction since every transaction is different and has a unique ID. So, 
In summary, you and your friends have a list of transactions where you guys write down what you send yourselves. You have a secret key that you use to apply your digital signature on every transaction. And you also have a public key generated from the secret key that you share to everyone to allow them to verify that you indeed agree with the transaction. Using this system, you and your friends can happily keep sending and receiving and sending and receiving money. The first flaw that appears is that someone can just overspend. What if someone decides to write that he's giving you $100 while only having $80? Now, I will not go in details about encryption algorithms, but this problem is solved within the verify function that we use to make sure someone really did sign. This means that, you're, that if you were overspending, it is just as invalid as if you had never signed or signed incorrectly the transaction. The second flaw is that this is not a decentralized system which means that if the transaction list is lost under oblivion, everyone just lost his transactions and therefore his money. The answer to this problem is to not have an authority that manages the list, but have everyone share a copy of the list and send themselves the transactions. But then how do you make sure you receive the right information? The answer to this question is called a blockchain. So your goal is to make sure all the copies of the transaction list contain the same information. For that, you need to stop thinking of this as a transaction list, but more as a chain of blocks. Each block is made up of a list of transaction, indeed, a certain code acting as a signature and the code of the previous block. For example, you and your friends have one block and you keep writing transactions inside. Meanwhile, one of your friends with his huge computer is a miner. I'll explain what that is in a minute. His goal is to make the link between your block and the previous block using a lot of computational power. If he manages to do that, it counts as a proof of work and it makes the block official. This friend also gets rewarded a certain amount of Bitcoin so he can keep up his good work. That amount right now is 12.5 Bitcoins, which is right now approximately 126,000 dollars, which is quite a great amount. But let's say your group of friends receives a, a set of blocks coming from a random location. They would probably not know what to do with it. So the rule goes this way. The longest chain is the legitimate chain. So if you realize that there's a longer chain coming from elsewhere, that means that you have not been up to date in the network and missed some transactions. You need to give up your list and download the most reliable chain if you want your transactions to count. But you might worry that there, that there could be someone spamming a ton of blocks and making a huge chain that would outshine everyone's. And you're right, it can happen. That person or group of people need to have more than 50% of the computational power. Because it requires computational power if you want to make all those links. And that used to be possible back in 2009 or 2010, but right now it's more like competing with China and Japan. But how does the said miner make the link between one block to the other? But what is a miner? A miner is someone who invests enough time and money on computational power so that he can sign the latest transaction block. Before explaining what that signature is, I'll explain what is a cryptographic hash function. A cryptographic hash function like SHA-256 is an algorithm that takes an input and gives an output of fixed length. That output looks random but is not random as it gives the same output for the same input. This algorithm is also unreversible. You cannot reverse engineer the function so that you can find an input from a given output. 
or at least no one has been able to reverse engineer it. So this miner with the earliest blockchain has to find a certain number so that when you apply SHA-256 in it with the info of the block you get an output beginning with a certain amount of zero bits. And since this function is unreversible the miner can only find this by trial and error. And this is why it requires such a big amount of computational power. Finding that hash is extremely hard, but it makes the transactions in the block rock solid. Then the miner broadcasts his results and everyone downloads his block, including the other competing miners. And the cycle continues. In summary, you and your friends made a fully functioning self-sustainable economy that does not require material goods. It only requires you to stay connected, to receive the latest blockchains, write your transactions inside when necessary and rely on a miner to make your transactions count. This means that you only need a computer to be financially active and independent. Banks become useless. I purposely forgot some other topics that are important, but I suggest you read on the subject by yourself. I believe this is one of the most interesting ideas that happened in the last 10 years, but I don't think it's capable of replacing our economy right now for many technical flaws. For example, if you send a transaction, that transaction will count only once a miner gets rewarded, which happens every 10 minutes. Since each block contains around 3000 transactions, Bitcoin can manage up to 5 transactions per second. Meanwhile, Visa can manage up to 24,000 transactions per second. But that doesn't kill Bitcoin, there are still many other alternatives trying to solve these problems. Thanks for watching.